Yo guys, what's up? Hopefully y'all doing good out there. We're back here with another top 10 terrifying, and this one is top 10 terrifying secrets hidden inside Texas. Now I was just scrolling along and came by this one. I live in Texas. So I was like, yo, let me check it, check this out and uh, see what they're talking about here. See if I know any of what they're talking about. I don't know what's in this video. So let's go ahead and dive in, tap in and see what's happening. Today, I'm taking you all on a trip to Texas, where we'll be discussing some of the darkest unsolved mysteries in the Lone Star State. Any Texans here, let me know some of the strangest right things you've experienced down in the comments. I'm your host, James, and these are the top 10 terrifying secrets hidden inside Texas. And we're starting off this list with what has been dubbed the Lover's Lane case. In 1990, a young couple, Cheryl Henry, 22, and Andy Atkinson, 21, headed out to spend the night together, but they were never seen alive again. Their bodies were found the next day in a wooded area in West Houston known as Lover's Lane. The scene was pretty horrific. There were slash wounds to both of their necks, Andy was found tied to a tree and we Cheryl to make this was one bigger for you guys. All right, let me know if this format works for you guys or not. Let's go ahead and cut it back just a little bit. Pretty horrific. There were slash wounds to both of their necks. Andy was found tied to a tree and Cheryl was found underneath a collapsed fence. Authorities were able to take DNA samples of whoever the assailant was, but they were never able to match it to anyone, meaning most likely this guy had no criminal record. And I do say guy because of the type of DNA they obtained. Over 30 years later, this case has sadly never been solved, and whoever's responsible could still be roaming around out there. The Amber Hagerman- so they say he was found tied to a tree and she was found under a fence? Uh, DNA suspected of a man and they never found him and that was just I wonder if that was just a one-off uh, Kind of killing that happened over at lovers lane. I was too busy messing with my <laughs> settings In case Amber Hagerman a nine-year-old girl from Arlington, Texas was at her grandparents house on January 13th 1996. Her and her younger brother were out playing. Amber was on her bicycle and she started riding further and further down the road towards a grocery store. Her brother decided to turn back, but Amber never came back. She'd been taken by a man in a black van in the grocery store parking lot. There was only one Damn. witness to her abduction. An intense search effort began with the community rallying together and law enforcement agencies mobilizing to try and find her. Sadly though, four days after her abduction, Amber's body was discovered in a local creek, not a long way from where she was abducted. What makes this case extra tragic is the fact that the assailant has never been found. This Dude. tragedy led Amber's mother, Donna Norris, to help establish the Amber Alert System, though an emergency notification system designed to rapidly disseminate information about abductions to law enforcement agencies, media outlets, and the general public. That's that little ringer thing you get on your phone, the little update. The Amber Alert System uh, has since been adopted and implemented in numerous countries around the world. Okay. So if there's anything, anything good that came out of the case, it's that. Next up, we- That's what I was gonna ask. Uh, is Amber Alert where you guys live? Is that something that's active? I know I get Amber Alerts all the time. I did not know that was the case that spawned it. So it's a case right here in Texas uh, that spawned, that created that, that was created from. Uh, man, but that's sad, dude. It's always a scary reality that this stuff happens. I mean, in my own neighborhood, people have caught on their cameras, people who um, have tried slowing down and talking to younger kids who have absolutely no business slowing down and talking to these kids, man. You're not related. You're not family. You're not a friend. You do not need to be stopping and asking a kid anything other than if they're in trouble or they're in danger, man. Uh, I really don't like that. It creeps me out as a parent. I do not want people talking to my kids unless you think they're in an imminent danger uh, and they need help. That's creepy. I don't know, man. Uh, so that's sad. You always got to keep a close eye on your children and I'm scared to let them even out and playing in the neighborhood, man. It's a scary world nowadays. We have the Killing Fields. This is a stretch of land located in League City near Interstate 45, where numerous bodies have been discovered over the years, leading to one of the most haunting and perplexing mysteries in the state's history. 
Since the 1970s, law enforcement authorities have uncovered the remains of multiple victims in this desolate area, earning it the chilling nickname. The identity of the assailant or assailants responsible for these deaths remain unknown and whose victims were primarily young women. Despite extensive investigations, the authorities have struggled to piece together the puzzle and bring the perpetrators to justice. Jeez, Various theories man. and speculations have of course emerged over the years, ranging from the involvement of multiple assailants to potential connections with other unsolved crimes in the region. The families of the victims as well as dedicated investigators persistently seek answers, hoping to one day unveil the truth and find a bit of closure. The Phantom- So I didn't hear if he said how close in proximity these bodies were to found, find, uh, being found near each other. Right there, it showed like a drainage ditch and multiple pictures all surrounding that drainage ditch. I don't know if that's actually where their bodies had been discovered, but that definitely makes you think it's uh, the same assailant over and over doing this. And there's just so many mass murderers, serial killers that we know of that have been caught, that we have stories on, movies on, books written after. Uh, they're studied in psychology, but then there's also all those ones that we don't know the identity of. And those people still are out there or live to their dying age and got away with it, man. And that's just creepy to know that that could be in your family. That could be somebody you've worked with. We don't know how close we have been to killers in our lifetime, or serious criminals in our lifetime. Of Texarkana. The Phantom of Texarkana. Back in the spring of 1946, a series of violent attacks happened in a 10 week time span. Whoever this creep was, they wreaked havoc in the town of Texarkana, going on a rampage of terror. He operated at nighttime, targeting mostly young couples who were just minding their own business, parked in the dark corners of the town. There have been eight victims, and five of which lost their lives. Law enforcement went into overdrive trying to catch this elusive boogeyman, but he managed to slip through their fingers every single time. The whole town was on edge. Folks were locking their doors, looking over their shoulders. The media ate it up, uh, too, referring to it as the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. And the story spread far and wide, making this a pretty infamous case. The phantom vanished as quickly as he appeared, though, leaving the town and its residents in a state of shock, confusion. Decades have passed and his true identity still remains a mystery. The ice box. So they, they named him the Phantom of Texarkana and called them what, like the Moonlight Murders or something. I've been seeing a lot today in recent times that they don't want the media dubbing, uh, giving these people a, a persona, uh, kind of you bolster them, right? And you play into their ego when you start branding these killers as a certain you know, Phantom of Texarkana, right? It gives them power almost beyond what they're already capable of and what they're doing, which is disgusting to us, um, to them that feeds something inside them. But once you start branding them and, and making them almost a character, uh, they say that that just enables them even more. And you have that uh, with the Zodiac Killer and with other killers throughout time where you know, you almost, the, the media just creates a bigger monster than what we're already dealing with. However, the media isn't responsible for what began in the first place. So, you know, yeah, I think that that kind of gives fire to them. But I don't know. What do you guys think on that, man? I think it's probably better to just avoid it and not, not brand these people and, and make them into a character. Box. In June of 1965, the residents of Houston, Texas were left in shock and confusion when the lifeless bodies of Fred and Edwina Rogers were discovered inside their own home. But what made this case truly macabre was the manner in which their bodies were found. They had been stuffed inside the family's refrigerator. The horrifying nature of the crime, coupled with the absence of any clear motive or suspects, has propelled the case into this realm of mystery. Investigations into the Icebox case were met with numerous baffling elements. The lack of forced entry suggested that the assailant was either known to the victims or possessed an intricate knowledge of their routine. The home had also been meticulously cleaned after the attack, which made, you know, gathering up evidence 
pretty difficult. Mm. And there was also this absence of a clear motive, which really added another layer of intrigue to it, leaving the investigators grasping at straws for answers. Over the years, theories surrounding the Icebox case have circulated. Some speculate that the crime was a result of a family dispute, while others entertain the possibility that someone could have been hired to commit the act. And then, of wow. course, there are those who hypothesize that the assailant may have simply been a deranged individual who really had no motive and attacked them yeah. completely at random. At number five, <laughs> that's on the, the most list, likely to me. I know that uh, I've heard of a story that there was a killer and he was a truck driver. And this guy had no motive and he was traveling, right? So when you're typically looking at a murder case, they try to work from the inside out. Who's closest to them? Who would have had a reason to do this? Who was around? You know, so when you're somebody who just has no tie and you're just moving from from location to, lo to location unchained uh it becomes much harder to identify you and track you down especially if you have no criminal history and they can't match fingerprints to you dna so, and it's probably easier today than it was at whatever time that this killer was doing that but it made it so i don't even know if they ever found out who he was but I do remember that he was a truck driver just driving around and, you know, maybe he's driving through a new state and he just plops down real quick and, and commits a crime and, and a murder uh, and he's off again. So it became really hard uh, to identify who that was. So that's sounds like what it could have been here, too, honestly, something along those lines. No motive, no connection, just a monster. We have the televangelist bomber. This disturbing case began back in January of 1990 when a mysterious package was sent to Lakewood Church in Houston. The daughter of Pastor John Austin opened the package and it exploded. Luckily, she survived, but wow. received third degree burns and cuts to her legs and abdomen. In April of that same mm. year, a second package was sent. This one to the Christian Broadcasting Network in Virginia, where a security guard named Scott Sheepers almost lost his life. The package had looked suspicious and the TV station had received death threats before, so they were pr on pretty high high alert in general. They put the package through an x-ray machine. Sheepers didn't spot anything out of the ordinary at first, but something about it still seemed off to him. He went to cut into part of the box before taking a couple steps back, at which point the package exploded and sending Whoa. Sheepers flying to the floor. He was transported to the hospital where shrapnel was removed from his leg and he did survive. Both packages wow. have been sent from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Until this day, the identity of the sender has never been found. Number four. That almost seems like a cut and dry case. Like, dude, they're going to find him. When you're using the postal system, I mean, I would have thought they would have had a way to track this person down. Still uncaptured and unidentified. And those few steps that uh, that security guard probably took away from that package could have been the difference in his life. But when you're already suspicious, suspecting it and you've gotten death threats and you already know there was another bomb sent to another church man why even take the chance and slice open the suspicious package you already have those concerns you already have those doubts but at least he took those steps backwards and uh, those potentially saved his life Sam Bass's treasure. All right. Sam Bass was this notorious outlaw during the late 1800s. He was known for his daring train robberies. According to the lore, Bass and his gang managed to accumulate quite a substantial fortune through their criminal activities, amassing a hidden treasure that till this day has never been fully recovered. The whereabouts of Bass's treasure has remained a mystery, fueling countless treasure hunting expeditions and inspiring countless stories and speculations. Many believe that Bass buried his loot in various locations across Texas, particularly in the areas around Denton where he operated. Some claim that Bass left cryptic clues and treasure maps, teasing treasure hunters with the possibility of finding his hidden riches. <laughs> Over the years, numerous treasure seekers have dedicated themselves to try and unravel the secrets of the whereabouts of his treasure. They have combed through historical records, studied old maps, and explored the Texas landscape in search of his stash. Despite their efforts though, the treasure has never been found. It's kind of like a Western version of One Piece. I love it. The thing is though, I think if someone did find it, I mean, would they report it? Or would they just kind of like keep it to themselves? I don't know. Maybe someone has found it. At number three. All right, there you go guys. So 
I live right here in Texas. If y'all want to band together, make our own treasure hunting group, let me know down in the comments below. We'll get this going. I'll start writing down some names, some contact information, and we'll band together. But ser seriously, I think if you find that, uh, like he said, if you report it, none of that belongs to you, right? It's stolen goods. I know I've heard of people finding stuff in their yards and they weren't able to keep it. They've uh, found stuff in the walls of their homes and then you got to go to court and, and fight to hold on to what you think is yours because you own that home. But man, the government's always looking at stripping everything away from you and there's no way they're going to let you have anything without a fight. So like he was talking about, if they found it, they're probably going to try to sell that on a black market and not let uh, anyone know that they have it in their immediate circle. So if you want to band together, let's do this thing. Three, we have the case of Lori Ruff. Lori Ruff was this woman with a seemingly ordinary existence, although she was always rather secretive about her past. And her husband, Blake Ruff, had a lot of questions. And as it would turn out, she wasn't exactly who she seemed. In 2010, she ended up taking her secrets to the grave after taking her own life, leaving behind a trail of these perplexing clues and unanswered questions. Blake Ruff discovered a lockbox in her closet that only added to his confusion surrounding her past. It seemed as if Lori previously went by the name Becky Sue Turner, oh, but man. Becky Sue Turner was the name of a girl who had died in a house fire back in 1971. Dude. So Ruff was left in kind of utter shock, confusion. Who was this woman he'd married back in 2003? Investigators were on the case, no. and as it turned out, Becky wasn't her only other name. Lori was actually born as Kimberly McLean, who had gone missing in 1986. She had run away from home at 18 years old. The question still remains though, why did she leave home? And how did she acquire the birth certificate of a girl who died in 1971? At number two, see, we have the Marshall See, 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 that, that's the kind of stuff that messes you up and you will never trust anyone ever again, man. He spent time with this woman, married her, and she died with these secrets that he can't find answers to. And the crazy thing is one of her names is somebody who died in a house fire. And that immediately to me connects the dots. And I think you had something to do with that person's death. I mean, it's like those stories where you have the husband living a double life. He comes home. He takes his kids to, you know, baseball practice, loves his wife, cooks dinner. And then he goes off and he d commits a murderous rampage at night. And then the next day, it's just back to normal. And the family doesn't know for two decades that he was a silent killer outside the home, man. And then it, it just has to mess you up for the rest of your life. It has to after, you you know, some of this stuff is brought to light. At number two, we have the Marfa Lights. The mystery surrounding the Texas Marfa Lights has fascinated locals and visitors alike for decades. Nestled in the remote desert landscape near the town of Marfa, these unexplained phenomena manifest as strange floating orbs of light that appear in the night sky. Witnesses have described them as glowing orbs of various colors ranging from white, yellow, to blue and red. The lights often dance and dart and hide in the distance, defying all conventional explanations. Numerous theories have been proposed, of course, to explain the origin of these lights, but none of them have actually been able to fully unravel it. Some speculate that they are the result of natural occurrences like atmospheric gases or reflections from distant headlights. Others attribute mm. them, of course, to supernatural or extraterrestrial origin, believing that they are the work of ghosts or alien visitations. Skeptics argue that the lights are simply the, you know, product of illusions or, you know, misinterpretations. But uh, there's quite the allure behind it, and it's led to the establishment of viewing areas and research centers dedicated to studying really? and observing them. Scientists, paranormal enthusiasts, and curious visitors flock to the region in search of answers. So that's something I'd like to okay. see. I might have to take a trip to Texas. Find some treasure, see some cool lights, it'll be a good time. And finally, all right, I found my, my first uh, my first teammate right here. But yeah, that's interesting. So we even have research centers out there observing this and trying to make an understanding. That means to me that this is more than just, you know, uh, word of mouth, J just like, uh, you know, believers. Just, hey, there's something out there. I mean, there, there's something to it now, in my opinion, if there's research centers being set up out there to try to observe this and capture what's going on. Now, what do you th guys think about extraterrestrial? To me, th this universe is just ever 
you know, it's it's <laughs> it's out there. It's huge. It's ginormous. There's got to be extra life out there in the universe. I'm not just talking about organisms. I think beings. There's got to be some kind of beings out there. Now, the real question then begins, have they ever visited Earth? Have they made it to here? Have we seen them? They're, they're unidentified flying objects, the, the extraterrestrial being itself. What do you guys think, man? I really am curious to know what your thoughts are on that. That'd be very interesting. And uh, if you guys wish, I might like to find some content on that and explore that a little bit. We have the Leveland UFO case. This case stands as one of the most compelling incidents in the history of unidentified flying objects and unfolded on the night of November 2nd, 1957 in Leveland, Texas, when the multiple witnesses reported encountering a series of bizarre events involving unidentified flying aircraft or aircrafts. Throughout the night, several motorists reported their vehicles stalling and electrical systems failing as they observed a large, almost egg-shaped object hovering in the vicinity. The witnesses described the craft emanating a blinding light in this intense heat. The accounts of the Leveland UFO sightings were remarkably consistent too, with witnesses from different locations reporting similar experiences. Law enforcement officers and local authorities were flooded with these reports throughout the night, which really adds to the credibility of the events. However, when law enforcement officers did arrive on these scenes, the crafts had already disappeared. This case uh, attracted the attention of the United States Air Force, leading to an investigation wow. by Project Blue Book, the official U.S. government program tasked with studying UFO reports. Despite their efforts, though, no definitive explanation was ever provided. Skeptics have offered theories ranging from, again, atmospheric phenomena to maybe electrical disturbances. But but others believe this is genuine extraterrestrial encounter. But others still believe it's uh, it's aliens, which I, I also like that idea a lot more. <laughs> All right, I love the consistency love some solid in the number proof, of witnesses, man. which uh, again, very interesting. With all that said, though, I've been your host, too James, big. and I will catch you, yes, you specifically, in the next video. All right, so I like that uh, little last part there that we are ending this video off at because I'd like to know about more about that you know being ex-military I hear a lot of ex-military that come out and they report they kind of whistle blow if you will uh, ex-air force ex-navy and I'm not talking about just lowly people like me you know uh, E5 I'm talking the high up ranks man um, you know 07s 08s and they're coming out and, and they're reporting that there was some serious information uh, that needs to get out to the public about uh, different kind of operations involving extraterrestrial life, life forms, um, UFOs, spaceships, aircraft. I don't know, man. I'd like to. I'd like to just get more information on this. If you've got any good uh, videos, maybe to tap into and explore, let me know. Um, and let me know about the formatting for this video. If you prefer, uh, you know, bigger in the back with a, a smaller face cam or the the way I did it throughout this whole video if that kind of works out let me know I'd like to figure out the formatting on this it's a trial and error right now work in progress so hopefully you guys are enjoying these style of videos I definitely enjoy them and I hope to keep keep them coming on this channel every now and then so I'll catch you guys on the next one until then be safe peace out there